Welcome everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Along with my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event, Congenital Heart Disease with Dr. Carl Toborowski. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to share it with a friend. We'll be taking questions via chat and we'll be sure to save some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many as possible. Tonight's event will focus on congenital heart disease, which are conditions present at birth. Later this year, we'll host another heart disease lecture focusing on acquired heart disease, which are conditions that develop throughout a pet's life. And we'll have more details on that event coming soon. Uh, I'd like to just take a quick moment and to let everyone know about an upcoming event on Thursday, April 20th at 6 p.m., we'll host a webinar on stress and, and anxiety in pets featuring Drs. Kate Anderson and Pam Perry from Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. You can register for that event on our website, amcny.org events. We'll also have that link in our newsletter that goes out tomorrow night. And now I am excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Carl Toborowski is a board certified cardiologist who earned his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. He completed a rotating internship in small animal medicine at Friendship Hospital for Animals in Washington, DC, followed by a cardiology specialty internship at Blue Pearl Partners in Southfield, Michigan. Dr. Toborowski then completed a cardiology residency at the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine. He joined AMC's very busy cardiology service this past September. Um, we are thrilled to have him at AMC and grateful to have him with us to lead tonight's lecture. Please welcome Dr. Carl Toborowski. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. Just need to start sharing my screen. And so hopefully you guys can see that. Looks good. So excellent. Thank you so much. All right. So um, mostly going to be focusing this evening on congenital heart disease in dogs. Um, I will speak briefly about cats. Um, however, the majority of what we do um, as far as interventions, procedures, things like that for our pet population um, is in dogs, um, but we don't want to forget about our cat friends as well. So essentially the outline of how this is going to run is a little bit of a discussion about just what is congenital heart disease in general? Um, what does that even mean? Um, and of course, you know, that would be um, we would definitely need to talk about what normal is before we talk about abnormal. So kind of a discussion about what the normal cardiovascular system entails. Um, and then of course, probably questions that you guys have as far as, well, when should I take my pet to see a cardiologist? Um, when is that indicated? And then move on to what are the types of congenital heart disease that we see in our pet population? Um, and mostly the focus will be on structural heart disease. So you know, the, the types of diseases that are going to affect the actual heart uh, shape, structure, size itself. Um, and just so you know, there are diseases out there as well that are congenital in our cat and dog friends that can affect what we call the cardiac conduction system. So the electrical activity of the heart as well. And then of course, uh, getting into the management of congenital heart disease. So whether that be intervening with medical management, um, interventional procedures, such as minimally invasive procedures, like we tend to do on the cardiology service or even surgical management. So with an actual surgeon. So what is congenital heart disease? Uh, and that's a very fair question. Um, oftentimes people will ask, was congenital the same thing as heritable or genetic disease? Uh, and it kind of depends. So congenital heart disease, that indicates that a heart defect is present at birth. That's really all congenital means, so present at birth. And so while that's most often detected in our young animals, puppies and kittens, um, it certainly can be diagnosed later on in adulthood, uh, maybe just went missed for some amount of time. Um, and that's okay, we, we can see that for sure. Um, and then there's heritable disease, um, which is similar, but it's a disease that has a genetic or inherited component that has a chance of being passed on to offspring. Um, and again, this is something, it's 
programmed genetically and that can be present at birth. It can develop later as well. I don't need you to, you know, don't memorize this table here. This is just a, an example of different types of common cardiovascular diseases that we see in our uh, cats and dogs. Um, not an exhaustive list and um, some of those diseases are actually acquired disease that, that pets get later on in life. But of course the focus here is going to be congenital heart disease. So what do we see in pets at birth? So there are many, many broad, broad categories of congenital heart disease, and that can include things like intracardiac or inside of the heart or extracardiac shunts, so blood vessels that maybe shouldn't be there or should have closed after birth. So we definitely see things like that. Um, we see things like abnormal valve morphology. So when I say the word morphology, what I'm really talking about is, is the shape of a structure in the heart. So if you have abnormal valve morphology, so that means basically one of the valves of your heart is not formed or shaped correctly. Um, and then certainly there are things that we see like vascular malformations. So uh, in some cases, you may be born with uh, two very large vessels leaving the heart. So your aorta, for example, largest vessel that leaves the heart. Sometimes you may be born with a double aorta um, and you have different types of what we call aortic arch anomalies. Um, so quite a wide range. Um, and this range of anomalies that can occur during development of the heart, and that can lead to simple defects, complex defects, um, varying degrees of severity, um, and clinical presentations. And that can include things like heart failure, cyanosis, so basically turning blue um, due to lack of oxygen. Um, and while some defects do not result in symptoms in an individual animal, there are others that can cause severe clinical signs and even unfortunately sudden death at a very young age. So when and why should I take my pet to see a cardiologist? Um, again, I'm often asked this question and, and the answer really depends on a number of things. So is there something like a heart murmur suggestive of cardiac disease or congenital heart disease? And a murmur really is nothing more than turbulent blood flow that you can hear as a sound in the heart. Um, and that, again, can be due to a number of reasons. Um, is blood flowing through a narrowed orifice in the heart that's making it flow um, at a much higher velocity that you can hear it? Or is blood shunting through a hole in the heart that shouldn't be there? There are a lot of different things that can cause turbulent blood flow inside of the heart. And that's what makes a murmur. Um, and so the question is, okay, well, do I hear a murmur that it could be suggestive of a congenital heart disease, as opposed to something like a benign murmur or an innocent or puppy murmur um, that can be present early in life in normal cats and dogs? Um, another question is, okay, is this a breed that is predisposed to getting congenital heart disease? So, um, you know, I'll show you a, a list uh, coming up in a little while of you know, various dog breeds that are, are just predisposed to getting certain types of congenital heart disease. So important to know, is there a breed predisposition? Because that may make you want to take a closer look, maybe even earlier than you normally would. Um, is there a known history of congenital heart disease in a relative of the patient? So is it maybe there's a litter mate that died suddenly as a very, very young uh, puppy or kitten? Um, is the uh, sire or dam, so the, the parents of the patient, could they have uh, a, a type of congenital heart disease that is known to be hereditary? Um, and then of course, we wanna know, are there clinical signs or symptoms that are suggestive of congenital heart disease? And so that may, might be things like lethargy, um, exercise intolerance. So you know, maybe if you have a litter of dogs and one of them just can't keep up with the others, uh, can't run as fast, maybe it runs half the distance as the others and gets really, really tired. Are there signs of respiratory distress? So, you know, labored breathing, things like that, um, that are, you know, that don't appear normal to you. Evidence of collapse. So do we have evidence that, um, you know, do we have a patient who's falling over, maybe even losing consciousness? Uh, and then of course, things like cyanosis. So uh, does it look like the gums or the mucous membranes of the tongue turn blue, especially uh, during exercise? These are all things that might, might say, mm, maybe we should you know, get our pet checked out. Um, and so you know, in most cases, successful management of congenital heart disease, it really begins with prompt recognition of a cardiac disorder, whether that be by a primary care veterinarian, 
um, or you know, one of the first vets that um, your pet may see, um, followed by referral to a cardiologist for a detailed evaluation. Um, in the majority of situations, the definitive diagnosis of something like congenital heart disease, it can usually be attained in a non-invasive manner with something like an echocardiogram, so an ultrasound of the heart. In most cases, there are types of complex cardiac or uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, however, that, you know, if you have something like vascular malformations um, or, you know, multiple levels of defects, uh, so just what we refer to as complex congenital heart disease, um, that may re require advanced imaging techniques. So things like CT scans, um, MRI, um, cardiac catheterization, in order to get a definitive diagnosis, get a more clear idea of what's going on. Um, and some forms of congenital heart disease require no treatment at all and may carry a favorable prognosis depending on the severity or, or just what it is. Um, and then other defects may be amenable to definitive therapy um, or at least some sort of palliative treatment. So it's important to understand if we're to talk about what can go wrong, you know, it's very important to know, well, what, what goes right? What should happen um, once we're born? Um, and you know, aside from very, very minor details, our heart and the heart of a cat or a dog is, is very, very similar. And so we can use this schematic that I'm showing you here as far as um, demonstrating the normal cardiovascular system. And if you just follow the arrows, um, that'll, that'll really help you as far as you know, tracing a, a drop of blood through the heart. And so we'll start on, the right side of the heart, which is actually the left side of your screen in the blue area. So this is your right atrium on that left side of your screen. Um, and this is where all blood returns to the heart after it's delivered oxygen to the body. And then if you follow the arrows through this right atrium, you go across your tricuspid valve into your right ventricle. Your right ventricle then pumps blood through this pulmonary valve and your pulmonary artery goes to the lungs. This is where blood gets oxygen, and then we return to the left side of the heart, which of course is on the right side of your screen, on the red side of the heart. Um, that goes into your left atrium, that top filling chamber there, into the left ventricle as it crosses the mitral valve. And then that left ventricle, it's the main pumping chamber of the heart, which then squeezes blood across your aortic valve, out your aorta, and then delivers blood to the rest of your body. And so you can kind of, get an idea of what this should look like. You know, you've got these four valves um, that basically, you know, they have a job where they open up to let blood flow in, in one direction only. And then they're supposed to close and form a nice tight seal to prevent any blood from flowing backwards in the wrong direction. And then of course you have these walls um, that separate the chambers of the heart. So you have what's called a septum on the bottom part of your heart that separates your left ventricle and your right ventricle. Um, and then what you can't really see on the top of the heart because the vessels are in the way in this drawing, but you have what's called an interatrial septum. So that's a wall that divides the top two chambers of the heart. So this is what should happen um, once a dog or cat or we are born. And so knowing that, we'll kind of jump in in a little bit to some of the things that can go wrong as far as structural heart disease. Now, again, I mentioned before, in addition to structural heart disease, there are some congenital diseases um, that are diseases of what we call the cardiac conduction system. So the system that's responsible for, you know, generating your heartbeat and your heart rhythm. So these are something we might refer to like electrical disease. Um, there are some types of what we call inherited arrhythmias that we see in certain dog breeds. They're certainly not as common as what we see um, as far as structural heart disease, but it, I did want you guys to know that this is something that does exist. Um, and so potentially, you know, if there is an at-risk breed, that is something we may talk to you about. Um, you know, if we see one of those breeds when we're, when we're doing an evaluation. No need to memorize this, but this is just kind of a, a flow chart of the different categories of structural congenital heart disease. Um, and I think it's kind of easy to kind of break it down into, is it a pink disease or a blue disease, which is, is really a simplification, but it, it can be helpful to think about it. And when I say pink versus blue, I mean, is this a disease that can result in very, very low levels of oxygen that are delivered to parts of your body that actually make you 
turn blue. Um, and you may have heard of, you know, when people refer to blue babies, and there are certain diseases that can cause that. And similarly, same diseases that can cause that in our cats and dogs. Um, but with your pink diseases, or what we call acyanotic diseases, where we don't have that problem of low oxygen going around to your body, um, we have a couple of different categories that we can break this down in. Um, and one on the left side, you can see that um, this, this says increased pulmonary blood flow. So what that means is these are diseases where you're essentially either shunting more blood to the side of the heart that sends blood to the lungs, um, or something is happening where you're basically, you're giving more blood to the lungs than you really should, and often more than the lungs can actually handle. Um, and probably the most common types that we see in that category is what is written down here. So defects in the walls that separate the, the, the heart chambers. So you can have an atrial septal defect. So again, your atrial septum, that's what separates the top two chambers of the heart. So if you have a hole in there, we call that an ASD or an atrial septal defect. Same thing on the bottom chambers. You can have a ventricular septal defect. Um, you can have something that actually affects both of those walls called a, an atrioventricular septal defect, which is pretty rare, but we do see it. Um, and then something that we see really commonly um, is a patent ductus arteriosus. And we'll talk about that in, in more detail. Um, and then another form of, of pink congenital disease is obstruction uh, to the blood from the ventricles. So essentially that would be as your heart is trying to send blood out either to the lungs or to the body, they're met with some sort of what we call obstruction. So is there some sort of narrowing um, as the blood leaves the heart? And the way I think about that is, if you think about just a regular old garden hose where you have water coming out of the hose, that kind of represents our normal, what we call laminar blood flow as it leaves the heart. If you stick your thumb over the end of that garden hose, you know from experience, you've probably all done that, that water is gonna shoot out of that, of that hose, or in this case, the heart, way faster than you would expect. And the same thing can happen with these types of diseases. And on the right, we have the category of cyanotic or blue diseases. Um, and these can, these can come from things like diseases that cause decreased blood flow to your lungs. Um, probably the most common one that we see um, is called Tetralogy of Fallot. And this is another one that we commonly see in people as well. Um, and then there's some other weird things where you get what we call mixed blood flow um, that is probably exceedingly rare um, in our patients, but we do see it once every few years probably um, for these types of diseases, but we won't go into those in, in great detail. And then I did mention, of course, there are some what we call congenital heart arrhythmias. Um, and you know, don't, don't freak out if you see your dog breed there. Um, these are, again, these are pretty rare, um, but there are some types of inherited what we call ventricular arrhythmias. Um, you know, there are types of mutations that we know of um, in some of these breeds, English Springer Spaniels, Rhodesian Ridgebacks, and probably more commonly, but again, not super common, German Shepherds. Um, and then similar to people, there are things like um, what we call accessory pathway uh, arrhythmias. But again, these things are pretty rare in our patients and um, probably won't be spending much more time chatting about these unless you guys have questions about them in the end. So we're often asked, okay, so what are the most common types of structural heart diseases that we see in dogs and cats? And really it depends on what year you're asking that question and you know, what paper or research you're going to refer to to answer it. Um, I would say I probably agree with what we're showing here um, in this image where um, you can see this pie chart on the right where it has you know, a number of different types of congenital heart diseases that we see in dogs. Um, and most commonly what you're seeing on these, this uh, top three list here, I, I would agree with. So pulmonary valve stenosis or what we used to call pulmonic stenosis, um, that's probably the most common that we see. And then patent ductus arteriosus is number two. And then what we call subaortic or a form of aortic stenosis is number three. Number one and two, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about tonight. 
Number three, um, we we won't, and mostly that's because not not because it's not an important disease, but I would say mostly because number one and two is probably those are the most common diseases that we are able to intervene um, with interventional catheter-based procedures. Um, Subaortic stenosis, we do have procedures um, that we have performed for that disease, um, but it's way more uncommon to do that type of procedure. Um, and really it's more of what we refer to as a salvage procedure or, or palliative care um, when there's really no more options for that disease. So we really will focus on those top two um, moving forward. Um, again, this is kind of a more recent paper that has come out recently in the last few years where, um, you know, this was done in one center over 20 years in Italy at about looking at 1800 dogs and 20 years with congenital disease. Um, but again, even in Europe, they are finding that the most common, the three most common structural heart diseases for, for congenital disease in dogs are PS or pulmonary stenosis, PDA or patent ductus arteriosus, and subaortic stenosis. Um, and when we talk about what breeds are predisposed to getting these, these diseases, you're, you're going to see there's a lot of repeat offenders. Um, and it doesn't mean that you know, if you have one of these breeds um, that there will be a problem. But if you do have a breed like you know, we see a lot of boxers, German shepherds, English and French bulldogs, um, there are a lot of these breeds that are unfortunately predisposed to getting a lot of these diseases. Um, and some of these breeds will get multiple of these diseases and sometimes even at the same time. Um, so definitely important, you know, as to one of those questions of when should my pet see a cardiologist? Well, if we have evidence that there's a heart murmur and you're one of these at-risk breeds, certainly it's probably, it would probably behoove you to, to you know, have a, a consult at some point in, in puppyhood. This is just another uh, short, short table as far as, um, you know, this is probably almost 20 years old now, this chart, but again, um, these are the most common breeds that we see for certain congenital diseases. So uh, PDA or patent ductus arteriosus, for sure, you know, if you're a type of poodle, uh, we certainly see that quite often. Um, Subaortic stenosis, uh, you can see Newfoundlands, or Newfies, they're probably the, uh, the poster child for that type of disease. Um, but definitely important, you know, if you do have one of those breeds, maybe have them um, checked out um, if there's a murmur for sure. Cats, again, um, we do have, um, you know, we have interventional procedures that we do on cats, but I would say that's much, much less common um, than the procedures that we do on dogs. Um, but cats are very, very important as well. Um, it's important to recognize that, yes, cats can have congenital cardiac disease. Um, it's important to recognize these. Um, cats, um, I would say for the most part, the number one disease that um, is at least reported in cats is what's called a ventricular septal defect. Again, so typically a, a small hole um, in the wall of muscle that separates those bottom two chambers of the heart. Um, and then you can see I did not list a two, three, four, five, because we're kind of all over the place as far as, you know, what, what are the number two, three, four diseases um, that we see in cats? And I think the problem with cats is they're so good at hiding disease um, and also murmurs in cats, um, they can be really difficult to actually interpret without doing something like an echocardiogram. Um, you know, if you look at what's been done in cats as far as uh, the research on cats and murmurs, something crazy like half of cats walking around with heart murmurs don't actually have heart disease and vice versa. Um, and so I think we're probably underdiagnosing some of our cat friends as far as, as congenital heart disease. Um, but I would say for sure, um, a VSD or ventricular septal defect is probably the most common. And as far as intervention, um, you know, we certainly have, have intervened with minimally invasive procedures in cats who have pulmonary valve stenosis um, and, and PDAs or patent ductus arteriosus. Um, but other than that, I would say, you know, we, we uncommonly do procedures like that with our cats. Um, again, do not try to read this entire table. This is just a recent publication of the reported available or even historically performed procedures for congenital heart disease in dogs and cats 
since the 1970s when when cardiologists started doing these things. Um, so basically, from the 70s up till you know like last year, this is what's been reported for certain diseases um, in veterinary medicine in dogs and cats. So if you're just quickly scanning this table, you can quickly tell that there's a lot of different types of interventional procedures that exist to address congenital heart disease in our patient population. However, many of these procedures, they're not widely available. They've only been performed a handful of times, um, potentially even experimentally. Um, and they may be prohibitively expensive in some of these cases, especially if we're talking about things like open heart surgery. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for something like that to run upwards of $50,000 for a cat or a dog. So a lot of these things aren't done commonly, um, at least in the United States. Um, and because of these reasons um, that we don't do these as commonly, um, what I'm going to do is focus the talk um, on the most common and widely available procedures that we do routinely as cardiologists. Um, and so it's important, you know, every single patient we see is an individual and there, we don't make blanket statements as far as all cats or all dogs with this should have XYZ done. A lot of this really is going to depend on a lot of things. And so these are just some factors that are going to influence our decision-making process when we evaluate a patient who has congenital heart disease. So anatomy of the congenital defect. So what is it? Where is it? How severe is it? Is it a mild form of the disease or is this pretty severe? Um, how big is the patient? Is this a, a still growing, you know, 16 week old patient who only weighs you know a pound or two and that's going to be really important for us to assess because if we're going to try and do some sort of interventional procedure we need a, a blood vessel that's big enough for us to access the heart because the way we access the heart as cardiologists is through something like a jugular vein or a vein in the inner thigh like a femoral vein or an artery and those need to be large enough um, for us to actually be able to to get in and, and access the heart not always possible if the patient's too small or too young um, is there presence of concurrent disease whether that be concurrent congenital heart disease or is there con concurrent systemic disease um, and so you know sometimes if we get to a patient that maybe was not diagnosed with a, a heart disease until later in life, could that patient have other things like diabetes or other endocrine disease or something that is going to make that patient maybe not as good of an anesthetic candidate? Um, is there need for advanced imaging to characterize the anatomy of the defect in question? So sometimes we say, okay, well, we see what the primary problem is, but maybe there are some other vessels that we're just not quite sure of. Um, are there structures outside of the heart that could be influencing our decision-making process that you can't see with just a regular echocardiogram? Um, and so you might need something like a CT scan to, to see that before we move forward and say, yeah, I think this is something we can address. Um, is there procedural availability? So um, are we even available to, to do a procedure like this? How much experience do we have um, in a certain procedure? Um, do we have the equipment available? Um, and if not, how difficult is it to order it? Um, you know, just like um, certain things in human medicine, there, there are our backlogs as far as, you know, certain types of equipment that we need um, in veterinary medicine. So important to keep that in mind as well. And then of course the cost, um, some of these procedures certainly can be expensive. And so these are all things that we need to look at um, in every patient and, of course, discuss this with our clients um, as part of the decision-making process. So keeping that in mind, um, you know, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the specific diseases that we see most commonly and, and how we diagnose them and how we address them. And we'll start with pulmonary valve stenosis, um, again, the, the most common congenital disease of the heart that we see in, in our dogs. So what is pulmonary valve stenosis, um, or PS for short? Um, so stenosis just means narrowing. And in this case, it's narrowing of your pulmonary valve. And so you can see here, I'm pointing to the pulmonary valve with these yellow arrows. Again, this is the valve that's going to separate the right ventricle from your pulmonary arteries and your lungs. So your right heart has to pump against that valve in order to get blood to your lungs. And when you have pulmonary valve stenosis, that just means if you look at that valve on the right side there, there's a little zoom in there, 
the valve basically is, we call it stenotic, but what does that really mean? Well, it means that it is much more narrow than normal. And that can be due to a couple of reasons, um, but it's kind of a spectrum of disease where we can see anything from, well, you might have just mild thickening of those pulmonary valve, what we call leaflets. We've got these three little leaflets that basically form this valve. Um, so you might have some mild thickening, um, or you might have really bad fusion of the valve leaflets. So they don't open all the way because they're kind of all tethered together. Um, or you might even have what we call um, like severe thickening of these valve leaflets and, and what we refer to as hypoplasia of the, of the annulus. So annulus just means the ring, which you can kind of think of the ring of a valve as the, the cardiac skeleton, this fibrous tissue that makes up the, the skeleton of the heart. You know, it's not not like a bony skeleton, but it's made of this hard cartilage um, that basically, however big your annulus is, that's how big it is. Um, you can't really do much about that um, as far as trying to make it bigger. Um, so if your problem is pulmonary valve stenosis, where you just have a normal size annulus, but your valves are tethered together, um, that could usually be easier to address than if you have both tethering of your valve and, and thickening of the valve, but you also have what's called this, this hypoplastic annulus. So if you have a much, much smaller, basically this ring that the valve sits in, that may not respond as well to an interventional procedure as you would with, you know, with a normal, what we call um, you know, a normal annulus. But the problem here, regardless of the type of, of this type of stenosis that you have, is that when you have that, thumb over the end of your garden hose, kind of similar situation here, your right heart has to pump a lot more strongly against that narrowed valve in order to move blood out of the heart and to the lungs. And like any muscle in your body, if you're working harder than you normally should, that muscle is going to get thicker, it's going to get bigger, and the result is what we call hypertrophy or thickening of that right heart muscle. And that can be a problem. And here's just a, a illustration on an echocardiogram of what the valve can look like. So this is just kind of a slice through the heart. Um, and part of these, part of the heart here is labeled where you see RA, that's your right atrium, RV, that's your right ventricle. Blood moves from that RV across the valve that I'm pointing to here and into your PA, which is pulmonary artery. So the arrow is pointing on this left illustration, the arrow is pointing to what we call a normal pulmonary valve. Might not seem this way, but um, take my word for it. This is a normal valve with nice, thin, crisp pulmonary valve leaflets. If you look at the center picture here, this is an illustration of what we call leaflet fusion. So this is kind of more of a, a, a mild form or mild to moderate form of the disease where the valves don't open all the way, but you have a normal size of, of that pathway or that annulus where blood leaves. So there is a problem with the valve in that the leaflets are kind of stuck together, um, but the actual annulus or that cartilaginous skeleton of the heart is normal, as opposed to on the right side, this is what we call annular hypoplasia. So really, it's not so much that the valve leaflets in this case are thickened, but the actual skeleton of the heart is much more narrow than normal. And again, like I said, that, that can pose problems if we're trying to kind of open up this valve with a procedure where we would have a, a balloon across the valve and kind of open it up you might not have as good of a result um, in that case. And you might see it says type A and type B um, at the top of those images there in the middle and on the right. Um, and this is kind of an older way of how we used to classify this disease where we would say, okay, well, type A, you just have this fusion of your leaflets. Type B is more of, well, the valves are really thick and you have this more of a narrowing of the cardiac skeleton, but we know we know now after after years and lots lots of data and research that really this is a, a spectrum of disease, um, and it's really not your type A or type B, but really you can kind of fall um, in any sort of range of these categories. But 
it's important to know. Um, these are just what the valves can look like. Um, these are just gross anatomy specimens of uh, an, four abnormal valves. Um, and so basically the center hole is actually the hole that the blood has to get through. Um, that outer hole is what the valve should normally look like. So normally that really, really big ring around that little hole, that's what the blood should be going through as opposed to one of these narrow holes. So you can see it, it's um, not only is there a spectrum of, of disease, but um, it can get really, really bad as far as how narrow these, um, these, these valves can get. So as far as breed predisposition for this disease, um, you know, this is a disease that's been shown to be hereditary or, um, you know, passed on in beagles and boykin spaniels. Um, but it is very, very common as far as, you know, which breeds do we see most commonly with this disease. Uh, we see it often in boxers, English bulldogs, and French bulldogs probably most commonly. Uh, and, but certainly, um, you know, you know, we don't discriminate uh, with these diseases. And so there's a lot of different diseases um, or a lot of different breeds where we, we tend to see this disease. But I would say um, probably most commonly, um, and I did read today in the news that uh, the number one breed of dog in the United States uh, is now the French Bulldog. So um, I think we are seeing a lot more of these as time goes on, at least in the last few years. Um, but, you know, what might be some of the clinical findings in a puppy with pulmonary valve stenosis. So, you know, for, for the vets out there who are listening, um, you know, if, if you have this disease, what we're going to listen for is a heart murmur, and we're going to listen for that at the left heart base. So that's where you should hear it. In these dogs, you might hear, you know, if it's loud enough, um, or if the, you know, if the blood is leaving the heart uh, quickly enough, you can hear this murmur radiate all the way to the right side of the body. Um, and as far as, you know, other, you know, historical findings, you know, oftentimes if it's severe disease, we might uh, hear that, okay, you know, my dog has what we call exercise intolerance where, you know, he runs around for a little bit and then gets really, really tired and has to nap for, you know, a few hours before he can get up again, um, which, you know, puppies should be able to run around for a little longer than that. Uh, sometimes we hear, you know, sometimes my dog runs around and then he falls over or he loses consciousness. Um, this is what we call syncope, if you have this transient loss of consciousness. And, and sometimes we'll see that with excitement or with exercise. Uh, sometimes we may hear that, um, you know, dogs with this disease are turning blue. And while that's not common, you know, there are some other concurrent congenital heart diseases that we see with pulmonary valve stenosis that can lead to turning blue, but certainly we can see that. Um, but we may see no clinical signs if the disease is mild or even moderate. Um, and sometimes we'll diagnose this disease in dogs who are 10 years old, um, who have just been living with this, and it's been just really, really that mild for their entire lives, and it's just, it's posed no problem at all. And that's great. And, and we, what we do find is that most dogs with mild to moderate pulmonary valve stenosis can live normal lives, but they're not all mild and they're not all moderate. And so we need to ask ourselves, well, why does this disease matter then um, if some of these dogs don't even go on to have really bad disease? Well, if you have severe pulmonary valve stenosis, it can lead to what we call heart remodeling. So the structure of the heart itself can actually change. The heart gets a lot thicker, the heart can get dilated, um, and the right atrium, so the chamber that sits on the top of the right side, that as well can get dilated. And all these things are going to predispose you then to what we call congestive heart failure on the right side. And that most commonly is going to manifest as fluid building up in either the abdominal cavity, so fluid in the belly, or Pleural effusion, um, this is what we refer to when we're talking about fluid in the chest. So that can, um, that can manifest, uh, and in some of these dogs with really, really severe pulmonary valve stenosis, um, we can certainly see that. Um, and if, if, if that disease is not addressed, you know, in a dog with severe disease, that can result in congestive heart failure, sometimes as early as, you know, one to two years old. Um, so really important if you do have that disease to, to 
get that figured out as far as, well, well, how severe is it and do we need to intervene? Um, and then in, in the really severe spectrum of clinical signs with this disease, you can see things like heart arrhythmias, so abnormal heart rhythms, and even sudden cardiac death, which I would say is a lot more rare with this type of disease, but we certainly can see it. So how do we go about diagnosing this disease? Um, so you know, you'll see I have plus or minus radiography, so that would be x-rays, uh, and then echocardiography, angiography, and then plus or minus some sort of advanced imaging. And I would say radiographs or x-rays, they can be helpful, but um, as far as how do we really diagnose this disease, um, you know, we, we tend to really rely on on echocardiogram, so ultrasound of the heart. Um, but, you know, if a puppy has a murmur that, um, you know, we're not quite sure what it is, uh, and, you know, if you're a primary care vet and you say, well, I hear a heart murmur, um, I think the first thing to do would be take some chest x-rays. That is absolutely the correct thing to do. Um, and while it may not show what's going on on the right side of the heart, you may see something like what we're seeing here, the arrow is pointing, um, to this is a very severely dilated, what we call pulmonary artery on the right side of the heart. Uh, it may not look obvious, but that's something that we might look for that would be suggestive of disease like this. Um, but if we do see that for sure, this is a case where we would say, yeah, I think it's time for, for this dog to see a cardiologist. So the gold standard for diagnosing this disease would certainly be an echocardiogram. Um, and what you might see, what, like what we see here in this image, is a severely dilated um, and thickened right ventricle. And that's what we're seeing on the, the top here. So what we're looking at, this is an echocardiogram. This is a view from the right side of the heart, where this bottom guy here that is getting severely flattened, this is our left ventricle. So that's the main pumping chamber of the left side of the heart, which really should look more like a mushroom. Um, and really it's, it's getting flattened by the right side of the heart, which really only should be about a, a third of the size of the left heart. So right off the bat, this is a severely dilated and pretty thickened right ventricle that we're looking at here. So right off the bat, if we see this, we say, okay, something is going on on the right side of the heart where there is way higher pressure than normal and much more volume in that chamber than we should be seeing. Um, and then there are other things that I can show you as well in the upcoming images of thickened or tethered valve leaflets. Um, and we'll also look for things like turbulent blood flow as it leaves the right heart and goes across that pulmonary valve. And then an echocardiogram can also help us look for additional cardiac defects. And probably the most common thing we see in conjunction with pulmonary valve stenosis in dogs um, is a, a communication between the top two chambers of the heart, which we call a, a patent foramen ovale or a PFO. And that's just a hole that should be there before you're born, but should go away once, once you take your first breaths over a few days to weeks. Um, and so we use echocardiography to take a look at that as well. Um, here is an example of um, similar, uh, you know, it's the same dog that we just saw in the previous images, but what we're looking at here is just kind of a different angle where we're actually looking at the pulmonary valve. And what we're pointing to on the left side here is fusion of those pulmonary valve leaflets. So all you're kind of looking at here is this little, this little band of white that's going across the valve. Um, so your pulmonary artery, that's that, tube of black um, that is basically um, kind of at a um, at 11 o'clock to five o'clock angle there. Um, and so that valve really should be opening all the way on the left side, but really what it's doing is just tethered. It's not opening all the way. And if we can put some color on there, and this is what we call Doppler blood flow, and you can look at the color, what we're seeing is this kind of mosaic of color, which represents really, really turbulent blood flow as it's leaving the right heart and going across that valve. So that's what's shown in that right image. Um, that is really, really turbulent or fast blood flow. Um, and that's not normal. And then what we're, what we're demonstrating here, this is kind of how we assess 
the severity of the disease, um, you know, one way we assess severity is, okay, well, how much remodeling or changes to the structure of the heart am I seeing? So like that image we saw before, is the right heart really dilated? Is the pressure really high? Um, but also we wanna know how fast is that blood leaving the heart? Cause that's gonna tell us, uh, it's gonna give us an idea of the pressure difference across that valve between the right heart and the pulmonary artery. Um, and basically what we can do is say, okay, well, we have these tiers or categories of severity ranging from mild to moderate to severe. And looking at these numbers, we can actually say, yeah, okay, well, we know based on the literature and data from human studies and studies in dogs that this is what we're gonna call mild, moderate, or severe. Um, it's not important for you to know what these numbers are, but um, we do have ways of, of saying, okay, well, we can not only qualify, but quantify the severity of disease. Um, and so that is another thing that we look at when we're doing an echocardiogram. And geography, this is basically injecting contrast or dye in order to evaluate cardiac anatomy. Um, this helps us locate the, um, the, not just the size of the valve, but where, where the defect is, where's that level of valve obstruction? Um, are there other things we need to look for like regurgitant or insufficient valves elsewhere in the heart? Um, what's the anatomy of, of the pulmonary arteries and our coronary arteries? And so that's what we're demonstrating here. Um, and I'll show you a live video of that as well. And then not as commonly, but we, we sometimes will look for things um, with advanced cross-sectional imaging like CT scans. And so this is just a CT of um, a dog with pulmonary valve stenosis kind of pointing to where the narrowed valve is. So there is medical management um, that we can try for patients with pulmonary valve stenosis. And most commonly we use uh, a category of drugs called beta blockers. And this is used to decrease the force of contraction um, of the right heart. It slows the heart down a bit and it also will reduce the amount of oxygen that is demanded by the heart. Um, and also has the added benefit of reducing the risk of heart arrhythmias. Um, and so we typically will have patients on this drug regardless of whether or not we're gonna move forward with something like a procedure. Um, so the procedure that we would do for a, a disease like pulmonary valve stenosis um, is what's called a balloon valvuloplasty. Um, and this is a minimally invasive catheter-based surgery um, where we do access the heart via just a small incision, typically in the jugular vein. And what we'll do is we'll position a balloon that's deflated across the narrowed valve and then inflate it. Um, and the goal of that is really to really tear those valve leaflets apart um, so they're not as narrowed anymore. And we wanna reduce that pressure difference um, across the valve. Uh, and the goal of that really is, is to reduce the workload of the right ventricle, um, stop or even reverse the amount of changes to the heart as far as the structural remodeling and changes, um, and even resolve or at least mitigate the risk of cardiac arrhythmias um, and heart failure. Um, and even in some cases, um, get some of these dogs off of medication. And so this is actually one of our patients that uh, we took to the uh, catheter lab uh, just a month ago. Um, and what we're seeing here, this is an angiogram where we've injected some contrast or dye into the right side of the heart. Um, and what that middle um, arrow is pointing to is the obstruction. That is where the valve is narrowed. Um, and that's what we want to address uh, by putting a deflated balloon there. Um, and what we do is we are able to actually measure very precisely, you know, how big or how narrow is that obstruction. And that helps us to actually pick out the appropriately sized equipment. So what we're demonstrating here is a balloon that is now being inflated across that stenotic valve. So we're inflating, inflating, inflating. And as you can see over time, that little hourglass or that waste it goes away as we're tearing open those valve leaflets. Um, and that's exactly what you wanna see in a procedure like this. You wanna see that completely go away. Um, and that's what we achieved in this particular dog, which is great. Um, so success of this procedure, um, it really depends on uh, the severity of, of the disease for sure. Um, the way we measure success though is, um, can we reduce the pressure um, or what we call the pressure gradient by about 50%. Um, it's great if we can um, or get 
you know, reduce the, the severity from severe even to mild or moderate category of pulmonary valve stenosis. Um, because like I said earlier, dogs with mild to moderate disease can have a, a very favorable long-term prognosis um, and live basically a normal life. Um, there are certainly complications to a procedure like this. Um, and um, that goes from you know, procedure failure, maybe we're not able to do the procedure because the valve is just too narrow, um, or we do the procedure and the valve re-stenoses or it becomes narrow again, you know, a few months or even years after the procedure, um, or we may not even be able to do the procedure just because of other comorbidities. Um, and probably the most common thing we see in terms of that would be something like uh, an anomalous or an abnormal vessel that kind of wraps around the very area of the heart we have to balloon, which would make it dangerous to do that. Um, you know, there are other interventional procedures that exist. Um, you know, there are stents. Um, so basically, you know, metallic, um, you know, tubes that you can expand and inflate at the level of the valve uh, to kind of open up the, um, the narrowing. Um, of course, there are risks with that procedure as well requires a lot more advanced training. Uh, there's a little bit more of a risk when you do a procedure like that, because um, you are leaving something behind that can migrate, it can fracture. Um, and then they've even tried valve implantation. Um, the problem with that is, you know, just to buy the valve itself um, is about $30,000 just for the valve, uh, not including the procedure. And it's only been done one time in a dog. Um, but these are areas of, of future um, avenues for sure for research. Um, patent ductus arteriosus, just because I want to um, make sure I get to this as well. Um, again, it's the, the second most common disease that we see in our patients. Um, and essentially, what this is, is, uh, you know, a, a, the ductus arteriosus, this is a normal structure that you should have um, before you're born or in utero um, that helps carry blood basically away from the lungs, because we're not using our lungs or not inflated yet before we're born. So you have a blood vessel basically that takes blood from the right side of the heart, skips the lungs, and then goes out to what we call your systemic circulation. So that brings blood to the body um, and delivers oxygen and nutrients without going to the lungs, because you're getting lung, you're getting oxygen basically from the placenta from your mother before this. Um, and basically what's keeping this, this vessel open is low levels of oxygen and high what we call circulating prostaglandins, which is, you can kind of think of it as a type of hormone. So these two things are kind of keeping that open, um, but we don't want that to remain open after we're born. So what should happen essentially is once we're born, we take our first breath, our lungs expand, um, and your pulmonary arteries open, a lot of things change. Um, what should happen is when that blood vessel or the ductus, it's experiencing higher levels of oxygen, we're not having as much of these circulating hormones to keep that tube open, eventually it should kind of cinch down and close. And usually that happens, depends on if you're a person or a dog, but usually within about two days to four weeks of, of after you're born that should close down and form this ligament. So it's a little stalk-like structure. Um, you can see it on the right side um, of this image. So instead of this open tube, you have this little ligament there that should just be closed because if you're using your lungs, there's no reason to skip them. Now, this is just a, uh, an animation of what you should see. So the blood vessel should no longer be open or patent. Um, and it's shriveled down to that little stalk-like ligament. In dogs and in people, sometimes you can get failure of this ductus to close. And so when we say patent ductus arteriosus, patent, it just means open, it failed to close. Um, and again, the, the reason that this fails to close um, is sometimes in dogs, um, you just don't have enough smooth muscle lining that blood vessel. If you don't have smooth muscle that lines the blood vessel, that's going to prevent its closure. So if you have the normal amount of smooth muscle that's kind of the, you know, surrounding that inner part of that blood vessel, that is what allows it to kind of cinch down over time and close. But in some dogs, 
they're lacking that muscle. And so you just end up with this funnel shaped open blood vessel that never fully closes. And that can become a problem. Why does it become a problem? Well, you can see from this image here, this is basically just looking at the vessels that leave the heart. So your aorta is on top, your pulmonary arteries are on the bottom, and that's what goes to the lungs. If you follow the arrows, what you can see is blood is going from the aorta and then through that open ductus and then goes off to the lungs. So the lungs, unfortunately, are getting much, much more blood than they should. So that's what we call over-circulation. We are over-circulating the lungs. And that can become a problem because if you overload the lungs, that can lead to congestive heart failure, severe dilation of the left side of the heart, arrhythmias. And in some cases, you can actually even switch the direction of that PDA or patent ductus arteriosus so that you have blood going from the right side to the left side. And that's its own problem as well. Um, but basically, no matter what, this can become a huge, huge problem. And if left unfixed, most dogs, about 64% of dogs will not survive to about a year of age. So <laughs> breeds that are predisposed, really these are kind of the smaller breeds like Bichons, Maltese's, Pomeranians, um, but again, it can affect any, any breed at all. Um, it does tend to affect females more than males, um, and we do see it across a variety of species as well. Um, and as far as heritability or genetic component, um, it is documented to be heritable in toy poodles and, and miniature poodles. Um, the most common thing that you'll see um, as far as exam findings um, is, um, you know, you might see a dog that is often asymptomatic, does not have any clinical signs, but then, you know, you might hear, oh yeah, but I think he coughs a little bit every once in a while, he tires easily, um, but you may even hear, you know, hear somebody say, oh yeah, he's got labored breathing, uh, you know, I'm concerned, um, and, and that's definitely concerning, especially um, if you hear what's called a continuous heart murmur, and so this is kind of a, a slam dunk diagnostic uh, for something like a PDA. So if you're listening with a stethoscope to a dog with a PDA, what you should hear is what we call a continuous heart murmur. So basically it's a murmur that does not go away regardless of where you are in the timing of your cardiac cycle. Um, it's not just in one part and then it goes away and then another part. It's the entire time you're listening, you should hear a murmur, but it can be easily missed because if you're only listening at the level of the heart, you could miss it. And so I always encourage people, if you're, if you're listening, to always move your stethoscope just a little bit farther up into the armpit, because that's exactly where you're going to hear it. And we've certainly diagnosed dogs with a PDA 10 years, 12 years of age, and, and those are pretty lucky dogs um, if they made it to that age. Usually it's because their PDA is very, very tiny. Um, so... As far as how we diagnose this, certainly x-rays can be really helpful. Um, there's kind of a, a classic finding uh, on a chest x-ray of a dog with a PDA. Um, and so you might see this kind of big bulge of what we call a ductus bump, um, which is kind of a, a, an aneurysmal bulge of your aorta um, at the level of your PDA. But you also might see things like over-circulation of your lungs, a really dilated left heart, um, really big pulmonary arteries. There's a lot of things that can give away um, a PDA. Um, certainly, if you're suspicious of one and you see x-rays that are suggestive, um, you know, if it quacks like a duck, sounds like a duck, looks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Um, but then, of course, you know, to, to definitively diagnose um, a PDA, echocardiography for sure is, is gonna be our gold standard and we can re readily identify that. Um, and what we're gonna look for, again, what we're looking at here is just a still image um, from a dog with a PDA where you have your pulmonary artery here. Um, and then this guy right down here where it says PDA, there's this little opening that separates PDA from PA there. And that little opening um, is the, the end of that blood vessel that should have closed. And so that is what a PDA is going to look like on an echocardiogram. And on a live image, what you're really going to see is just really, really turbulent blood flow consistently and continuously, just like the murmur, going through that vessel. 
Um, and then you can do advanced imaging to diagnose something like this. This is on the left, what's called a transesophageal echocardiogram, where we're doing an echocardiogram um, with an echo probe in the esophagus, um, looking at the heart kind of behind it. Um, and then here's a really beautiful uh, CT image of a, of a PDA as well. Um, and this is just a very, very nice volume rendered CT image um, that someone else did where you can really see this vessel um, that connects your aorta, that's the AO there, um, to, your, to your pulmonary artery. And so similar to our patients with pulmonary valve stenosis that we looked at, we use angiography to help us characterize the shape of our PDA, um, but also to help guide us, get the most accurate measurements to help select, you know, the appropriate size of a device um, to occlude the vessel for a PDA. So I, I have a little still image on the left here um, that can kind of slow things down um, to kind of help demonstrate what it is we're looking at. Um, what I'm showing you here in, in the, the live image is this is a an angiographic catheter um, that's going up your femoral artery um, in this dog um, and then in the aorta, and basically positioned right at the level of your aorta. And then we're injecting contrast or dye that fills up the aorta. And then this extra vessel or this PDA that I'm pointing to, that should not be there. So that is very abnormal. And that's allowing blood to shunt from the aorta all the way into the pulmonary artery and then the right side of the heart. Um, so this is not normal. And that's something that we want to occlude. And so this is how we go about actually measuring um, when we're actually doing a procedure. Um, so you can see on the left side there, I'm I have an arrow pointing to the actual PDA itself. Um, and what you really wanna see is this tapering segment of the PDA it is really vital to know what shape the PDA is because certain shapes are just not amenable to occlusion with an actual occluding device that we typically would use. You need to have this kind of tapering in order for an occluding device to actually take hold in a fixed position. Otherwise, a device that you put out there could actually become dislodged, it could migrate into areas we don't want it to, um, and that's really not desirable. So it's really important when we're doing these procedures to kind of know, what is the actual size and shape of this PDA if we are to intervene? So how do you intervene? Well, there are a couple of different ways um, to intervene to fix a PDA. Um, and you can do a surgical approach. Uh, this is what we call a surgical ligation, um, where you actually would um, you know, make an incision in the chest to access the heart um, and then tie off the vessel. Um, you can just kind of tie it. Um, a surgeon will go find the PDA. Um, I put a little sign here um, to show you where exactly we want to tie off the vessel. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy to do if, if you are an experienced surgeon. And, and success rates are generally very, very high um, for occluding this type of blood flow. Really, the downside is it's a little bit more invasive. There's a higher risk for things like bleeding. Um, but this may be our only option for a very, very small patient or a patient with an unfavorable shape of a PDA. So if they don't have a PDA that tapers nicely, we might say, yeah, I don't think we can do this safely. I think, I think this patient needs to go to surgery instead. And then there's the way that we do it as cardiologists. So what we typically would use is a device that looks like the device on top. Um, this is called a, a, an Amplatz canine ductal occluder or an ACDO that you essentially, similar to this animation that's there on the bottom, is you basically plug the hole um, with that type of device in order to occlude or stop blood flow across the valve. Um, and either one of these procedures, so the, either the surgical method or this method, is basically curative um, for this type of disease, um, which is fantastic. It's not often we can say that for a lot of our diseases. Um, there are a few other ways of, of doing a minimally, minimally invasive procedure uh, to fix a PDA. Um, so in the old days, we used to use things like, uh, like embolization coils, um, which we don't often do anymore now that we have this type of device. Um, but then there are things like covered stents um, and then certainly things like vascular plugs that um, are starting to become, I wouldn't say commonplace, but people are using them and, and our patients, uh, but certainly they're using a lot, using vascular plugs more commonly in, in people. Um, and then here is a, a live image of an Amplatz canine ductal occluder 
being deployed in one of our patients. So again, what we're seeing is you have this device positioned right in the ductus arteriosus, um, and we're deploying uh, both parts of, of the device. And so you have a little a disc um, at the end here, and then a second disc um, kind of closer to the part of the catheter. Um, and that's what we're using to actually plug the hole, for lack of a better term. Um, so you can kind of refer to the initial image that we had with our angiogram to see exactly where you want to position that, kind of right where that vessel tapers. And then how do we demonstrate that we've done it successfully? Well, before we kind of unscrew our device uh, from the catheter and leave it in there for life, we want to know, OK, did we do a good job? Is there any evidence that there is residual flow across that ductus? And so what we do is we inject another puff of contrast to demonstrate that we've completely occluded blood flow across it. And once we're satisfied, like I am here in this patient, we unscrew the that long uh, catheter from the device and we leave it in there for life. Um, and basically this is curative. And this is a post-op x-ray of one of our patients um, with the device in place right where it should be. So really, the prognosis for a disease like this after intervention um, is outstanding. Um, Long-term survival prognosis is great if you can um, intervene um, you know, before it becomes a big problem. So before you have uh, things like congestive heart failure or reversal of the direction of your PDA, um, this is considered to be basically curative. Um, of course, you know, clinical signs, concurrent congenital heart disease, um, or if you have insufficient valves elsewhere in the heart, um, that can be negatively associated with long-term survival. So this is one of the diseases where we say, if we can intervene a little sooner rather than later, I think that would be ideal. Um, Again, there are certainly other diseases that we see, um, you know, commonly, and some that we see less commonly um, that we didn't really discuss tonight. Um, and while there are interventional procedures available for, for maybe not all, but most of these diseases, we as cardiologists may not recommend performing them, um, either due to lack of data that would demonstrate improved outcomes or improved quality of life, um, or even data that demonstrate. Um, any sort of change in long-term survival. Um, and in some cases, we might just recommend medical management of some of these diseases, especially if it's maybe not severe or if it's not causing clinical signs and symptoms. Of course, you know, every patient that we see is an individual. Um, and we're always as thorough as possible when making recommendations and making our evaluations. And you know, our goal is to always ensure that our clients are as well-informed as possible to help guide them to make decisions for their loved ones. So, you know, I'm very, very happy to take um, any questions you guys may have. And I, and I thank you. I know I went a little bit over, but, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure to, to chat with, you know, chat with all of you this evening. And um, like I said, very happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And we really appreciate you taking on this huge topic and breaking it down so well. Um, and you did a fantastic job explaining everything. Thank you. Um, and we do have some questions, so let's, I won't waste time. Let's get to it. Um, okay, so you kind of addressed this, but for pets with heart disease, do you recommend um, getting treatment early? Is earlier better um, for, for these congenital? Yeah, so that's a that's a really, really great question. And it's one that we that we get commonly. And, and I would say it depends on the disease and the disease severity. For sure, something like a, a PDA um, that we just talked about, that's one where I would certainly recommend sooner rather than later. And, and the reason that I do that is we know that this disease is it has the potential to change course very quickly um, in the matter of sometimes weeks to months. Uh, you know, one of the things that I mentioned, but I didn't talk about in detail, is what happens if the direction of blood flow changes with a PDA. Because what we talked about tonight is called a left to right PDA, where you essentially have blood shunting from the left side of your circulation to the right side of your circulation, which is what we call a, a normal or left right PDA. However, there's always risk that a patient can develop high pressures on the right side, meaning if you develop what's called pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the uh, arteries that go to the lungs, 
or potentially if you have, you know, necrosis uh, or arteritis, you know, inflammation of the ductus, you have a potential to switch direction where you have now blood flow that goes from the right side to the left side of your circulation. That's a huge problem for us and for the patient because you can no longer intervene when that happens. Because if that happens and if you were to tie off that blood vessel, that's really bad. You can, you can probably, you can cause right-sided congestive heart failure pretty much immediately if you were to try and do that. So that's something that we would want to certainly intervene um, before something like that happens. Um, and then certainly because we know the risk of heart failure with that disease can be high in some of these patients, that's another reason we would like to intervene sooner rather than later. So if somebody says to me, you know, I'll think about it, you know, maybe I'll um, you know, can I come back in like six months? I'd probably recommend, well, why don't we come back in about a month before, you know, before things, you know, go awry. Well, I like that you say that you really look at each case individually, which I think is, is so important. Um, for these congenital diseases, if, will it show by a certain age? And if not, you know, are, are they out of the woods at a certain point? Also an excellent question. And, and the answer is, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, so there is certainly, like I said, we come across patients 8, 10, 12 years old where, you know, someone shows up who maybe they've never seen a vet before in their whole life. Um, and they say, yeah, you know, my, my dog has a, a new murmur. And you listen and, and you look on an echocardiogram and you go, oh, wow. Yeah, actually, I mean, new, new to you, but this dog's had a murmur for 12 years because um, this is congenital disease um, and through no fault of anybody. Sometimes it can just go, it can just go missed. And those are lucky dogs because something like a PDA, for example, with again, certainly diagnosed in older patients, those are lucky dogs who probably have a very, very small PDA and they could get away with something like that for quite some time. Same thing if the severity of disease like pulmonary valve stenosis or, or maybe even subaortic stenosis, whatever it is, um, if it's mild enough, they may never show any clinical signs. I've certainly intervened on dogs in their, you know, in older, older dogs, 10 years old, um, who, you know, we saw something like a PDA or a dog with pulmonic or pulmonary valve stenosis and and you know, an owner said, "Yeah, I still want to intervene," and we've done that. Um, but it, you know, I think it's a lucky dog who does not show symptoms and clinical signs at an early age from a disease like you know anything that we've talked about. Uh, but for sure, you know, these diseases are not discriminating, and so sometimes we do see clinical signs of a disease that was congenital that, for whatever reason, um, you know, a patient did not become what we call clinical or start showing signs until later in life. And again, there's, there's really no way to tell, um, you know, is this going to be a problem um, later down the line? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I know you did say you did address cats, but we do have a lot of cat, <laughs> cat lovers and cat questions. So Excellent. why are these procedures not done as much? Is it their size or, you know, on cats? Yeah, so sometimes it has to do with size. Um, you know, cats in general uh, tend to be a lot smaller than our, our canine patients. And so sometimes it's a matter of, are we even able to access the heart with the equipment that we have at hand? Because again, one of the things we have to assess when we're making decisions is, are we able to access the heart in a minimally invasive manner. So usually that's through an external jugular vein or a vein like the femoral vein in the inner thigh. Um, so that's certainly one thing to think about. I think another thing is we don't commonly see these diseases in cats in the clinic as often as we see it in dogs. Um, we probably see, you know, we see congenital diseases in dogs weekly. Um, you know, and, and certainly depends on your geographic, you know, wh where you are practicing in the country or the world. You know, when I, when I lived in the South, um, it would be unusual to have two days go by where I didn't see a congenital heart disease. I think in New York, it's a little bit different, um, but certainly we probably see, you know, one every week to 10 days, I would say. Cats, um, much more rare. Um, and again, you know, I, I think whether that's due to, is it a bias because fewer people tend to bring their cats to the vet to be seen, which 
that that certainly I think is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, are cats showing clinical signs as readily as dogs are? You know, we don't often see cats. Uh, we don't take them for walks often. Um, we don't, it's not often that they run around, you know, like crazy in, in the yard and they get exercise intolerance. So it, it may be something that's just not recognized. I think, I think it is unrecognized. I think there are way more cats out there than we know that have these diseases. So I think size is one thing, not recognizing it or seeing it is another thing. Um, and then, you know, I, I think do we have the equipment available if it is something like a very, very small patient? But we certainly see it. Um, I would say um, probably the most common thing that we tend to intervene on would be something like a PDA in a cat, um, and then maybe like a pulmonary valve stenosis in a cat. But again, it's it's just not done as commonly. And also for that reason, you know, we don't have a lot of data to say, you know, what is going to change. Uh, you know, first of all, what are the long-term survival data for cats if you intervene, if you don't intervene? And so it's not as you know robust as as the data that we have for dogs. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Um, thank you for addressing that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so for pets with heart disease, do you recommend dietary or exercise restrictions? Excellent question. Um, so dietary, I would say, depends, but. It, the way it depends is, um, you know, in in people, I think we tend to focus a lot on things like sodium restriction, as far as the types of heart disease that humans get, mostly when they're older. Uh, you know, we don't typically have the types of acquired heart disease, like coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, things like that, um, where we need to say, don't eat salty foods, don't eat hot dogs and cheeseburgers every day. You know, these are cats and dogs eating cat food and dog food. Um, the only thing I will say as a caveat to that is the data are still out there. People who study this who are not me know a lot more about it than I do, but there are associations with certain diets um, and acquired heart disease in dogs. Um, up until the 1980s, late 1980s, when we figured out that cats need taurine, we knew that, uh, or we now know that cats who were deprived of taurine in their diets developed really, really bad dilated cardiomyopathy. All cat foods now should have taurine in it. That's not really an issue anymore. The things that we tend to see as far as diet and heart disease is in our dogs who are fed what we would kind of describe as kind of, it used to be, we used to call it boutique, exotic, and grain-free diets. What we now know, it's more things like diets that are high in things like legumes, lentils, what we call pea and pulse proteins in the first 10 ingredients. Um, and I think we need a lot more information and data before we say exactly why it causes dilation of your heart and weakening of the heart. But what I can tell you is in some of those dogs, you switch their diet, the heart can go back to basically normal. So, but as far as congenital disease, um, I have no evidence to tell me that there is something that we need to do, you know, nutritionally to address these patients. How so, about exercise and then, restriction? And then, yeah, same thing with exercise. So. Exercise restriction is certainly something that we may recommend for different types of disease. So for example, some of the diseases that are like cyanotic or blue baby diseases that we see, so things like, I didn't talk about it, but tetralogy of Fallot, or diseases where you have shunting of blood from the right side of your body to the left side of the body. These are diseases that very, very commonly will have clients report to us, you know, every time he goes for a walk, tries to play with his brother, gets really tired, turns purple, falls over. Those would be a cases where I would say, yeah, I think it's probably in, in the best interest to maybe not push it. Um, and so maybe exercise restriction is a, a strong recommendation in a case like that. Something like, you know, more often, I, I would say 99% <laughs> of the time, someone, a patient with a disease like that, if they push it a little too far, they're probably not going to pass away from that. If it's just, oh, I, I played a little too hard, but it can happen. Um, so for those types of diseases, for sure, and owners will know that. They will recognize pretty early on what 
a dog or cat can and can't do before it's too much. Um, so certainly, you know, if, if it's if we're planning on intervening with a procedure, we would probably say maybe hold off an exercise, maybe some exercise restriction until the procedure, and then we can kind of reevaluate. Okay, great. Um... How likely is it for congenital heart disease to be found in multiple puppies and kittens in the same litter? Mm. Yeah, so it, it can happen. It can depend on the disease. Certainly, if you have a uh, if you have a litter that has been bred by, you know, uh, a sire and a dam who are known to have heritable disease the likelihood and the risk of having multiple offspring with that disease is way higher than if it was just, you know, one affected parent um, or just like a relative. But certainly um, in some of the diseases that we know have a, a, a heritable component, uh, and among those may include something like a PDA or subaortic stenosis, um, certainly it can happen. I think the thing with, you know, once a pet gets to us in the clinic, we certainly ask that question. We always say, do you know anything about the litter mates or anything that happened to the siblings? And I would say more commonly, the answer is no, we, have, we don't know um, unless it's a breeder. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes that certainly happens where we'll see multiple affected um, in a breed, but I would say it's not as common, but absolutely. And if there is ever a situation where you have an affected, um, you know, dog or cat with one of these diseases, absolutely the recommendation would be do not breed that cat or dog because there's a high chance that they could pass it on. Okay, great. Um, we have many people just saying <laughs> what, how wonderful this was. Thank you for your clear and informative presentation. Really, it was really wonderful. Um, and let me see. Uh, we did have a question just about where um, Schwarzman AMC is. And we are in Manhattan um, on 62nd and York. Um, and we have questions also just about this having this recording. We will send this, as I mentioned, to everyone tomorrow. I know there's a lot to take in, and, and people probably want to watch it again. Um, but thank you so much, um, Dr. Toborowski. This was really fantastic. Um, we're so lucky to have you, as I said, at, at AMC. Welcome, and we are so grateful for your time tonight. Um, thank you to Kimberly Young for doing such a wonderful job organizing this event. Um, and just a reminder to everyone um, that our next lecture, Stress and Anxiety in Pets, will be on Thursday, April 20th at 6 p.m. Um, and we'll have that information um, in our newsletter that goes out tomorrow night. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate you logging on and spending part of your evening with us. Everyone have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Good yeah. night. Thank you so thank much. You.